So I'm Kevin Kenny, the director of Glaxman Ireland House. Um, we're gathered this evening to celebrate the new editions of James Carroll's classic novels, Mortal Friends and uh, Supply of Heroes. Um, welcome back to NYU, uh, Jim, and welcome back to Ireland House. Um, an equally warm welcome to John Sexton, uh, President Emeritus of NYU, who will serve as the respondent uh, for the lecture this evening. So let me introduce both speakers. Um, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, longtime columnist for the Boston Globe, uh, James Carroll received the Thomas Merton Award in 1972 for his writing against the Vietnam War. He was a distinguished writer in residence here at NYU at our Center for European and Mediterranean Studies in 2015. He is the author, prolific uh, author of uh, eight uh, nonfiction books, last count, including An American Requiem, which won the National Book Award, Constantine's Sword, uh, the first of your books that I read, The Church and the Jews, which won the National Jewish Book Award, A History of the Pentagon, House of War, which won the Pan Galbraith Award, and The Truth at the Heart of the Lie, How the Catholic Church Lost Its Soul, uh, a Publishers Weekly Best Book of the Year. Um, James Carroll is also, of course, uh, one of the most acclaimed novelists uh, in the United States. In addition to Mortal Friends and Supply of Heroes, is the author of 10 novels, uh, most recently The Cloister, set in the old Irish neighborhood of Inwood in Manhattan. And he will reflect uh, this evening on his early novels about the Irish rising and the Irish arrival in America, how he sees them as, quote, a particularly Irish mode of moral reckoning uh, where the Irish are today uh, in America and where we might be headed. John Sexton uh, asked me to be brief uh, in the introduction. Uh, that's a challenge. Uh, I'll, I'll try. Uh, John Sexton is President Emeritus of New York University, Dean Emeritus of NYU Law School, and the Benjamin F. Butler Professor of Law. And after a distinguished career in the law school, uh, he was named the university's president in 2001, served in that capacity until 2016. A member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, John Sexton sits on numerous educational boards today, and he is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he's published very widely in legal scholarship. Uh, he's also the author of the New York Times bestseller, baseball as a road to God, seeing beyond the game, uh, which emerged from a seminar taught here at NYU. Um, and I could go on <laughs> and embarrass uh, John. Um, in 2016, Commonweal Magazine honored John Sexton as the Catholic in the public square. Uh, so finally, uh, a word about the format uh, this evening. Um, after James Carroll's lecture, uh, John Sexton will give uh, a brief response. Um, Jim has agreed then to take um, questions from the audience. I suspect we'll have a lively conversation about Irish America here this evening. We will be passing a mic uh, through, the, uh, through both sides of the room. Um, we'll then invite you all to join us downstairs for a reception. Uh, the one thing we're not doing, it's kind of a post-pandemic thing, is we're not doing an elaborate book signing, and we'd put Jim through another hour of work uh, on that. Uh, at your seats, you will find flyers uh, from the publisher uh, for both of the books uh, that are available in uh, attractive paper, paperback editions. So uh, without further ado, uh, James Carroll. You know. Thank you, Kevin. Green nostalgia, an Irish-American novelist on myth, memory, and moral fiction. 
Mortal Friends, first published in 1978, tells the story of Coleman Brady, an Irish farmer who involves himself in the Irish rebellion of the teens and the Civil War in Ireland of the early 20s, and later escapes to Boston, where he rises to and falls from political power and seeks a second chance through the life of his son. The novel was dedicated in 1978 to Lexa. Supply of Heroes, first published in 1985, a historic ep epic of love and war set at the height of World War I in the defining year of 1916 knotted alliances and conflicting loyalties of an Anglo-Irish family are tested during the Easter Rising and two months later, the Battle of the Sum. This novel was dedicated to my mother and to Jenny, our daughter who died that year shortly after being born. In casting my eye back across four decades to my early novels about the Irish rising in the old country and the Irish arrival in America, now that these two novels are being reissued by Blackstone Publishing, I am considering what I wrote, when I wrote it, and why. But before I speak, I want to say something. I'm deeply grateful to Glucksman's House for this welcome. Grateful to you, Kevin, Kenny, and to Mary Elizabeth Sh Len Lennon for all that you've done to open this precious place to us. I'm especially grateful to John Sexton, who honors me and us by agreeing to kick off our discussion. I will speak fairly briefly about my books and I hope about the implications they may have for this fraught present moment in America when nostalgia has itself been refashioned into a potent political weapon. And I look forward to hearing what you think. And I do want to acknowledge the special pleasure I take in the presence here of some folks whom I actually do not know. <laughs> Green nostalgia, myth, memory, and moral fiction. Nostalgia. The late Russian-American cultural theorist Svetlana Boim pointed out that the word comes from nostos, return home, and algia, longing. She defined nostalgia as, quote, a longing for a home that no longer exists or has never existed. Nostalgia is a sentiment of loss and displacement, but it is also a romance with one's own fantasy, unquote. Obviously, such longing underwrites a current American preoccupation with feelings of racial, cultural, cultural, religious, political, and to gender displacement. But even half a century ago, I was myself moved by versions of such longing moved to write these novels, in fact. As a Catholic raised on the Genesis myth of a lost paradise, and as an Irish American schooled at my mother's knee to have an eye forever cast back toward the old country, its glories, not its miseries, I came naturally, if somewhat innocently, to the work of unpacking 
the longing for what was lost. I unpacked it in the 1970s and 80s. And now, by reconsidering these two works, I want to unpack it again. So my remarks divide into two instances of nostalgia. A longing for what seemed lost back then, and a longing for what seems lost today. I lived in Boston in 1978. The city was racked then by the busing crisis, you remember. I was living in South Boston, which was the ground zero of Irish Boston's resistance to the court-ordered rollback of racial segregation. I was a wannabe writer, but before I could get to my desk each morning, I was distracted by the sounds of police sirens and would go to my window. I saw my Irish Catholic neighbors rudely demonstrating on the sidewalk in front of the Tuckerman Elementary School right across the street as police escorted a small cohort of black children into the school from which white students were being kept home. My neighbors routinely, daily, yelled racial epithets. They hopped and scratched themselves as if they were monkeys. All of this in the face of nine, 10, 11 year old children. Within the sight of my window, half a block away, hung a lynched effigy of W. Arthur Garrity, the federal judge who had issued the busing order. These were my people ferociously defending a home, what I had attempted to make my home, a neighborhood that, though we didn't see it yet, had never actually existed. The longing was real, though. But so was my question. How had we come to this? To this ugliness, this cruelty, this contempt? That was my question. And as an Irishman, I knew that the clue was lost in the world across the sea. Those to whom evil is done, I knew my Auden, do evil in return. So, at my desk, I set out to tell a version, my version, of the Irish backstory beginning with the evil done to an immigrant people by an excluding Brahmin establishment in Boston, which perfectly reproduced the prior evil of the colonial oppressions of a peasant people whose suppressed old country memory was of what we would call today genocide. Oh, Danny boy. Mortal Friends celebrates the Boston Irish for refusing to settle for immigrant inequality, even as they became the city's champions of intolerance. But the main enemy turned out to be neither the old British overlord nor the patrician Boston establishment but repeating the pattern when the anti-British rising morphed quickly in 1916, 17, 18 into the intra-Irish civil war. Ourselves alone, a phrase, of course, which translates Sinn Féin, our mortal enemies include our mortal friends. <laughs> 
Judge Garrity, after all, was one of us. Once I began to pay real attention to the ferocity of the Irish war just then raging in Northern Ireland through the 1970s into the 1980s, I knew I had only begun to reckon with the Irish longing for a home that no longer exists or has never existed. My mother, an immigrant's daughter, had told me with wet eyes of her Uncle Jim, implying I was named for him. He had, she said, died a hero in the 1916 rising against the British. I discovered years later that while James Morrissey had indeed died in 1916, he was in fact a member of an Irish regiment in the British Army, and he died in France that year, perhaps at the century-defining Battle of the Somme, where casualties topped one million. The Irish ranks, of course, were, under British orders, the first ones to fall. While fewer than 500 Irish died in the Easter Rising, more than 200,000 Irish served in British regiments during the Great War, with tens of thousands of them being killed. In the green fog of Irish nostalgia, they were lost as happened in my mother's family, to Irish memory. The most important thing about my great uncle Jim was forgotten, deleted in the fog of green nostalgia. Those men in the middle, like him, were the ones I had to write about which I did in Supply of Heroes. The complications of my uncle's story prompted the question, how to act honorably amid heartbreak, disillusionment, and profoundly conflicted loyalties. And that's why the main character of the novel, as I saw it, had to be an Anglo-Irishman, the ultimate man in the middle and why the novel had to end in no man's land at the sum, the place in between, where the only real meaning of love and honor had to be, against every form of nostalgia, desertion and betrayal. If Mortal Friends was a response to events in the 1970s, 1970s Boston, Supply of Heroes responded to 1980s events in Ireland. John Hume, the dairy-bred leader <coughs> of the nonviolent rejection of the paramilitary brutalities of both sides, was the middleman who brought Sinn Féin's Jerry Adams to the negotiating table planting the seeds of what would ultimately become the Good Friday Agreement, the agreement of 1998, where the mantra in Hume's formulation was no longer the mythical, a united Ireland, but instead an agreed Ireland. The first chapter of that final peace accord was the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1985, the year Supply of Heroes was published. The killing that began in 1916 could stop only when the Irish reckoned fully with the way in which the lost home for which they longed had in fact never existed. My mother's Uncle Jim had not died in the Irish Rising the pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen and down the mountainside. So much for nostalgia 
as it operated back in the day when I wrote these novels. What of now? When I think of 1978 and 1985, what imagined homes existed? What sentiments of loss and displacement underwrite the ongoing romances with one's own fantasy that are, in fact, forever a mark of the human condition? In my writing, without making large claims to the moral purpose of fiction, for which, for example, the novelist John Gardner was pilloried, I instinctively attempted to make moral sense of what could only seem like the moral failures of intolerance, tribal chauvinism, Asian and violence, Irish failures. But it's true. It's true. There were whole worlds of meaning and consolation and order that seemed to have been lost. In those years when I was writing these novels, the Irish-American subculture that gave me my identity, the identity I still claim, was still intact, even as its shadow was being brought into the light. For us Catholics, and for many others, to take one example, Pope John Paul II was riding high just then as a global figure of Catholic moral authority. And across the decades, he seemed to recapitulate the high point triumphs of Roman Catholicism, especially when inspiring the Polish labor union solidarity, he seemed to usher in the astounding fall of Soviet communism. A pope did that. At that point, Irish politics in America was approaching an apogee with Ted Kennedy having weathered Chappaquiddick to emerge as a fresh tribune of democratic liberalism with Mayor Ray Flynn as a surprising figure of racial healing in Boston. The United States of America undergoing an astounding political shift when President Ronald Reagan began to say yes to the disarmament proposals of Mikhail Gorbachev, preparing for the near miracle of the nonviolent resolution of the Cold War. All over the world then, South Africa, the Philippines, Central America, Israel, Palestine, even Berlin, peace seemed to be breaking out. And Ireland, good God, the promise of peace. Before we knew it, we Irish. For the first time in more than a century, young people stopped leaving Ireland. No more Danny boy. What a world it was. Or was it? The golden moment of peace after the end of the Cold War was trampled on, especially by American claims to have won a conflict that was ended mainly by a Soviet leader. The Reagan shift in foreign affairs went hand in hand with the Reagan shift in a domestic economy which unleashing an unprecedented financial and cultural elitism soon enough hollowed out the American middle class and made poverty great again. The astounding dismantling of the nuclear arsenal was halted by the peacenik president, Bill Clinton, condemning the human future again. And a national disenchantment was institutionalized after 9-11 when every criminal mistake that had been made in Vietnam was brought back in force in Iraq 
and Afghanistan. And for the Irish and Catholics, the collapse of order and meaning came so quickly as priests were shown to be rampant abusers of children with church authorities, including popes and every bishop, protecting the rapist priests instead of their victims. In Boston, the beautiful neighborhood that the anti-busing protesters had claimed to be protecting turned out to be a drug-infested fiefdom of an Irish mobster who peddled the drugs while his politician brother protected him instead of the victims. With, not incidentally, corrupted mix in the FBI protecting the mobster. The Boston Irish, their own worst enemy, mortal friends, indeed. In Ireland itself, meanwhile, the scandal of abusive priests and nuns exploded. In the Emerald Isle, the Roman Church emerged as a brutal colonial oppressor to be compared with London, even if its modes of torture and starvation were spiritual instead of physical. If the church could utterly fail in the home of saints and scholars, what couldn't fail? The new millennium, in other words, came as a crushing disappointment. If we Irish Americans underwent such a radical disenchantment, so did our whole nation. And why shouldn't we Americans today be so at the mercy of feelings of loss and displacement? Nostalgia, you betcha. Red, white, and blue. And as we see from the MAGA movement, such unmoored longing for worlds that actually never existed, so orderly, so happy, so male-dominated, so Christian, so white, is dangerous. And an unbelievably brutal version of this nostalgic drama, of course, is being played out, staged, also and even more terrifyingly, in Russia, with Ukraine bearing the burden of that malice. Still, Supply of Heroes and Mortal Friends are novels concerned with the human capacity to surpass exactly such losses of ethical and cultural meaning. The human species has come all this way precisely by surpassing itself again and again and again. This has been true physically, but it has been true morally, too. Human beings shaped by the past have found an endless variety of ways to invent the future. And moral purpose has been at the lively center of that impulse. It is a mistake to take the Genesis story, the one we Catholics love so, as an ultimate expression of nostalgia, longing for the lost home of long ago, paradise. Paradise, forgive me, Milton, is not what was lost. Paradise is what we humans were put here 
to create. Genesis is not about the past. It is about the future. And how do we know this? We know it by the stories we tell, the dramas we put on stage, the novels we write. What is a story but a structure of order, a way of taking the chaotic and random and painful and absurd flashes of experience that are constantly rushing at us, forever threatening to overwhelm us, and arranging those flashes according to the measure of meaning. We are a meaning-creating species. So we take those shards of experience, especially the darkest and sharpest ones, and we shape them. How? You've known this forever with a beginning and a middle and an end. We acknowledge the conflict. We face the crisis. We undergo the catastrophe for the sake of a resolution, even if the resolution generates the new conflict that sets the scheme in action again. Catastrophe, after all, means turning point. Thus, we surpass ourselves. We do so by the stories we tell. And no people have put this ingenious human capacity for surviving and thriving to better use than we Irish. The imagination, as Coleridge put it, is the repetition in human beings of the creative I am of God. I am, we are. If God draws order out of chaos, as Genesis says, we are how God does that. Not the lost past, but the unfolding future. I do not claim much for myself as an artist, but I admit to the astounding happiness it has been to have been doing this very thing for all these 50 years since I began with Supply of Heroes and Mortal Friends, which, to repeat, I dedicated to Lexa and still do. Thank you. So uh, let me be very, very clear. Um, this is the denouement. Uh, J Jim Carroll is a hero to me. Uh, when I try to describe him to friends who are about to meet him, I, I use the word holy. There, there is an aura, an ineffable aura about him that exudes all of the best that the word holy means. And it is a cognate, of course, for the word love and his love for Lexa and the ease with which he loves each of us who are privileged to be called his friends is, is in the literal sense, in the way Rudolf Otto meant it, it's awe, and for those of you that don't understand Brooklyn, that's spelled A-W-E. <laughs> it, 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 it's awe-inspiring. I, I wouldn't even be attempting this if Jim had not asked me to do it, and if Jim asked me to do something, I'd do it. So it's, uh, 
It's my task to offer the responsorum as a beginning of the conversation. Uh, I, I, I will not be long. I, I, we've just listened to poetry. Uh, this is relatively mundane prose, but I'll try to add a twist, a twist that Jim and I have discussed many, many times over hours of conversation and that is consistent with uh, what he has said. Indeed, it's captured in the closing of what he said and my job is, is to make obvious what each of you felt, I think, and, and, and that is that the talk we just heard uh, is a talk of joy, a talk of hope. Uh, I, I sometimes describe the, my, my life in teaching as being a possibilitarian. <laughs> and and that, uh, that set of remarks by Jim was, was uh, a manifesto of a possibilitarian. And, and that's what I take away uh, from it. Now to do that, I, I'm going to introduce a third data point. The last time that we were together in this room, Jim presented an extraordinary talk on Irish Catholic anti-Semitism. Uh, I'm gonna not turn to that, although the novel I'll turn to is very much about that and it's his most recent novel, The Cloister. Uh, I'm not going to get into what the novel is about except to add to the fact that uh, it, it, it has as its heart the long-standing struggle of my church, and I come here as an Irish Catholic, Jim's church, with anti-Semitism. And when I speak of anti-Semitism, it's very personal to me because my Lisa, his Lexa, my Lisa, who still remains 16 years after her death, the embodiment of deep, deep love for me, uh, was and is Jewish. And we've raised our children and our grandchildren Jewish. So I'm the only Goy in the family. <laughs> I was the Shabbos Goy for the Twin Cantors and the Jackie Robinson of the B'nai B'rith Little League, uh, the first Goy to play in the B'nai B'rith Little League. But, but what's obvious from Constantine's sword and from this great novel I'm going to add to the table, The Cloister, is that our church made a terrible choice. Uh, Jim has taught me to think of this in large terms, and I have a PhD in religion, and we tend to think in millennia. Uh, but a thousand years ago, our church made a choice between Bernard of Clairvaux and Abelard. And Bernard of Clairvaux preached the Christ of war. And, and preached the Crusades. And Abelard preached the Christ of love. Love of all humans. Love of the fact of humanity. And we, the Catholic Church, canonized Bernard of Clairvaux and excommunicated Abelard. And, and that church choice, hard for a Brooklyn boy to say, but that church choice for the Christ of war of a world that was characterized, anti-Semitism being a prime example, but a world that was characterized by the dividing of the world between us and them. That, that still haunts us and blinded us of the possibility offered by the story of Christ, Christ who loved Christ who gave himself, it blinded us to the Beatitudes, it blinded us to the resurrection. But here enters Jim, okay, uh, with these three data points, the two novels we celebrate tonight and this other that I've introduced. And I want you to know that the, as moving and as powerful as I found the very 
dominant theme of Jim's talk with two sentences near the end that uh, will become my text for just four or five minutes. And I, I, I actually wrote them down here. I'm going to quote them just to put them back in your present memory. The one was, paradise is not what was lost. Paradise is what we were put here to create. Genesis is not about the past, it's about the future. So take that and then hear this. The second quote, coming right near the end, just before his re reaffirmation of love for Alexa. The imagination, as Coleridge put it, is the repetition in human beings of the creative I am of God. That's the end of the quote from Coleridge, and Jim says, I am. We are. If God draws order out of chaos, as Genesis says, we are how God does that. Not the lost past, but the unfolding future. So those two passages make this, for me, uh, the manifesto of a possibilitarian. Uh, essentially, Jim is saying to us, nostalgia is not a, a, an easy chair or a warm bath in which you settle with great comfort. It is a dangerous form of fantasy. Uh, and, and even as it can evoke great, great things in, in the hands of someone like Jim in these novels, we, we have to understand the deep danger of this because it comes with that understated premise of separation of us and them. But, but with these closing passages, Jim, Jim actually offers us liberation to hope again. Uh, this is a poignant topic for me and for Jim. Uh, you'd never know it by looking at the two of us, but he's older than I am. But, and, and, I, and I'm in my 80th year, so I've lived a long life. I have a relatively modest future. Uh, we're, as they say, closer to the end than the beginning, to put it euphemistically. Uh, many in our stage uh, would be content with dwelling uh, joyfully on the past, especially if they've had the blessed lives that we've had. Uh, not perfect, uh, without pain, but uh, extraordinarily blessed. But I find myself attracted uh, to continuing to look to the future, the way those two passages with which Jim ended uh, call us to look, uh, to look to the future, not so much my own future, but the world's future. Uh, and, and I know Jim embraces this, uh, this, this outlook. So maybe as uh, uh, people in the last lap or laps, uh, we have some special standing to speak of the perils of nostalgia. Now, now, it's interesting to me that, that Jim and I are disjunctive in, in, in the history that he presents and on a topic we care about. The, the, the one annoyance in your talk for me was in your description of the halcyon days of the 80s. You, you seem to credit John Paul II. I mean, he really did speak glowingly of that uh, disappointing pope. For, for, for me, the, the, the future was captured in John the 23rd and, and his opening of the windows and his offering to us of not only an ecumenical religious world, but an ecumenical secular world, if you extend it as you did in your remarks, if you take the notion of moving from an us and them world to, to a world that is uh, characterized by difference, not a melting pot, characterized by difference, but the difference that one sees in a watch.
where you can still identify each of the elements, but they interlock in ways that create a whole that some of the parts. And, and John the 23rd began to move our church toward that. Strangely, the frequently contemned pope, maybe proving that a, a broken clock is right twice a day, uh, Pope Pius XII, not as bad as O'Malley, but close, okay, uh, for his silence uh, in, in the face of Hitler. But he did write Mr. G. Corpus, an encyclical that said the church consists not just of those who are visible members of the church, but of all good people, all good people. And he set a predicate for what John the 23rd did. And then there was contemporaneously the glorious Teilhard de Jardin, who, who made the analogy to evolution for the human species at the moral and secular level, and said there is a point omega that is foreshadowed by Christ. Christ, the, 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 the man who became God, Christ displayed for us the way sometimes the first experiences of evolution, the, the ones that don't make it through, show what could be. And he showed us what humankind could be at Point Omega. And Teilhard was on the Fordham campus when I was going to college. And, uh, and, 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 and my friend Daniel Berrigan, a hero below 14th Street these days, uh, but a man who had written in 1956 on a blackboard in Brooklyn, extra ecclesia nulla salis, outside the church there's no salvation. And when I went up to him after class and said, Father Berrigan, does that mean my best friend Jerry Epstein can't go to heaven? Daniel Berrigan said to me, if you don't baptize him, he won't go to heaven. But I saw him in those years, in the late 50s and early 60s, migrate to the Daniel Berrigan that we worship. He, he had grown beyond that, the same way John the 23rd and, and Teilhard had brought us. And, and, and then there was the election of the Bishop of Milan, who had written a great book on the democratization of the church. And those of us that were in the doctoral program at Fordham, the first PhD program in religion in the country, we rejoiced. Montini will be Paul VI. Democracy will come to the church. What was foreshadowed in Mr. G. Corporis will come to be. And then he wrote his first encyclical, Humanae Vitae, in which he reaffirmed the teaching on birth control. And we were devastated, devastated, devastated. And we went to our mentors and they said, you know, if he had written it the way you want, Ottaviani and the rest would have gone into schism church would be divided. He wrote it this way. And what are you saying? You're saying he's wrong. That's the beginning of the democratization of the church, which may take generations. And then, if you believe in conspiracy theories, they killed the pope, and then Paul VI, and then your JP too, to be followed by the deplorable Benedict, right? Benedict, uh, the silencer. I remember when his appointment as Pope was announced, the New York Times had an article with the pictures of 10 theologians he had silenced, Hans Kung, Edwin Schillebeck, Karl Rahner. I was teaching religion courses at the time. This, this was my curriculum. He had silenced them all, they, five of them, five of them. Uh, were on my curriculum. A sixth, Charles Curran, was my first client when I got to NYU because Catholic University had stripped him of his tenure because of his teaching on birth control. Six out of ten. This is our Pope, Benedict the Silencer, who uh, ironically, given his reputation, was deeply anti-intellectual because he had the only truth. He didn't believe in critical reasoning. But finally, Francis. whose mentor was Raimundo Panicar, the great liberation theologian. And hope for hope and possibility. And then those little shadows of what could be, the world you described that we could make even out of catastrophe. The first time I felt it, I actually wrote a pastoral letter to the NYU community. I was appointed in May of 2001. 
There's nothing in Dean's school about 9-11 or President's school about 9-11. I wrote a pastoral letter because below 14th Street, not the uptown crowd, okay, but below 14th Street, we could feel humankind operating on a higher level of morality. Even Giuliani had the right language for a week or two. Okay, a, a person that didn't even know the Vatican Council existed. But he had it until he turned it into a third term argument. But, but we felt what I called, I titled this piece, The Moral Surge. And, and I would submit that uh, you see it today in the people of Ukraine. The embrace at last in a country that's observing, the United States, that has lost faith in all its institutions, lost faith, faith in a common wheel, you see people dying for a common wheel, for, 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 for a reality that is, that was yesterday for them and they want tomorrow. This is not some nostalgic reality. This is a reality that is, and they want more. They want to be in NATO. They want to be in the European Union. And in a way, that's point omega. That's an example of point omega in the world. So uh, it was interesting to me to see how hopeful I read what you said. Uh, and very interesting to me, not just because I've just bought tickets for my third visit to Neil Diamond, the musical, <laughs> which for those of you that will not see it on principle, ends with the song, I am, I said. I am, I said, right? Uh, that Jim Carroll, my hero, would end with I am, we are. And I don't know, you couldn't possibly remember that I speak to you frequently about the Sanctum Sanctorum for the Sexton family. 20 times I've been down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Eight times I've done the river. And when I try to explain it to people who are going on the trip with me, I say to them, you are going to experience something beyond anything spiritual you've ever experienced in your life. Because one mile down Bright Angel Trail, a 10 mile trail, you will be out of recorded history. You're in the face of a two billion year old geological clock. And then you'll feel utterly insignificant but with a power that the Greeks felt at Eleusis, suddenly you realize, I am insignificant, but I am, and I love, and there is Lexa, and there is Lisa, and there is possibility, and God bless you, Jim, for pointing it out. Um, I think we have a few issues to discuss. <laughs> um, and James Carroll has, has kindly agreed to take questions. We will be passing mics in each room. Uh, two of our wonderful student workers, Fanta and Kadisha, will pass the mic if you have a question, so the acoustics will be a little better. I might even get a question in myself at one point, James. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, John, my goodness. Uh, thanks. You leave me speechless, John, which is lucky because I'm finished talking anyway. Uh, it's your turn to talk, and I invite your comments or questions either way. Anybody? Um, hi, I'm Ted Smith, and thank you very much for that message of hope, uh, which you're bringing to us. And um, having read your novel when I first came to the United States and uh, really relished it in every way, you know, I'd hope that you would be writing a novel, as you say, bringing meaning to the chaotic events of today. Maybe you're not, but if you're not, which novelist do you think is bringing meaning to today's extraordinary events? Is there an Irish person out there doing that? And uh, how, would, how would you imagine that? Thank you. 
Ted, thank you for that uh, question. It gives me the opportunity to put on the table the work of Niall Williams, a wonderful Irish novelist of today, young novelist who's published half a dozen novels. I just finished reading Four Letters of Love, which is an astonishing novel set in the far west of Ireland involving the back and forth with the Aran Islands, a beautiful story of um, the opposite of nostalgia, I would say, because it's people at the mercy of invented, imagined, illusioned futures, and they're uh, trying to track them down. And in the tracking of them, uh, they come together and find, um, they find themselves. Niall Williams, the Four Letters of Love, he's also the author of This is Happiness, a magnificent, simple story about the last village in Ireland to uh, receive the benefit of electricity. It's an account of this small remote village in the West. Finally, in the 1950s, the poles and wires of electrical infrastructure make their way that far uh, west, and the arrival of the telephone poles from Norway, no trees stout enough for telephone poles in Ireland, uh, brings great joy and great, great trouble to this town. Uh, watching a town come into the world of electricity, speaking of nostalgia, all that's gained and all that's lost, too. So Niall Williams is a novelist I would heartily recommend. Other comments or questions? I just wanted to know whether you would respond to his comments about John Paul II. <laughs> I'm invited to respond to John in my comments about John Paul II. John is such a positive person, and you've seen it on display, that he has a, a weakness, one weakness I'm aware of. He sometimes doesn't recognize sarcasm. I, uh, I, I only wish my mother were alive to hear me accused of having been nice to Pope John Paul II. But uh, my point about John Paul II, though, the 1980s, Ireland is a case in point. When Pope Francis came to Ireland in 2019, you may have noted, um, relatively few people turned out to greet him. The th you know, the uh, church authorities prepared passes and tickets for the great mass in Phoenix Park. They prepared a million pickets. A million people had gone to hear John Paul II's mass in Phoenix Park. More than a million people saw John Paul on the streets uh, of Ireland in that triumphal tour in the early 1980s. Uh, the movement from John Paul in the affections of the church uh, to Francis is, is the tracking of the tragic story. But the point I wanted to lift up was that was the kind of end point moment of high Catholic self-assurance. We, we had arrived. We had arrived. And um, the seminaries were full. Well, they were beginning to empty out, that's true. And the post uh, Humanae Vitae crisis of the church was underway, but it wasn't really fully felt yet. And John Paul II was the church's great act of denial. And he was the beginning of the denial of the abuse crisis. It's a, it's a further scandal that John Paul II was canonized, proving you don't actually have to be a saint to be canonized by the Catholic Church. Um, so John, you know, your assessment of John Paul II and mine are similar, John. Um, my assessment of Pope Francis may be a little tougher than yours, but because of the disappointment I feel, that was the subject of my last nonfiction work, The Truth at the Heart of the Lie. 
Kevin, you were going to say something. Yes, uh, thank you so much. So earlier today here in Ireland, House, we, we hosted a delegation from the Belfast City Council, uh, including the current Lord Mayor of, Bel uh, of Belfast. So it's an interdenominational group uh, headed at the moment by uh, Sinn Féin, Lord Mayor. I was very struck by uh, one thing they said to me here at lunchtime, which is when we talk to 25-year-olds today, and we realize that they didn't grow up with soldiers on the streets, and they never saw, have seen a gun. We realize that the binary of orange versus green just doesn't make any sense to them. And I came across that same phrase in my office this afternoon, looking at the work of a unionist photographer. The binary of green and orange doesn't uh, work for them. It doesn't make sense to a 25-year-old. So. In Irish America, the whole thing worked on binaries. The strength of the identity worked on binaries. Um, some of them pretty ugly, as, as you've written about anti-Semitism and racism. So to do with race, to do with religion, to do with sexuality. Um, so here's my question. Uh, can, can you give us uh, maybe a new Genesis story this evening uh, whereby Maybe in Irish America we retain the us, uh, but not in opposition to them. Well, that's a profound uh, comment, Kevin, and a question too. And far be it for me to actually come up with a new Genesis story that does that. But I will say something about Genesis in response to what you're saying. The binary, the binary, the us against them begins in the Genesis story. It's uh, and it shouldn't surprise us that it begins with the man against the woman. Because you recall that the story of the fall is the story of the forbidden fruit. For some reason, God puts a tree in the middle of paradise. Everything that human beings could want is everywhere, but there's one thing that they're forbidden from having fruit from this tree, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And um, the story is that the serpent convinces the woman, Eve, that the fruit is the answer to the human quest for meaning and power. And she takes the fruit and offers it to Adam who eats it. And when God, the voice comes down, and uh, when God sees Adam and Eve, you recall, for the first time, and this is the first signal of the fall, uh, Adam and Eve cover themselves. And God asks this great question. They cover themselves in shame because they're ashamed of their of their physical makeup, their body parts. And God's question was, who told you that you were naked? And then God asked for an account of the violation of his one rule. And Adam says, the woman, the woman presented me with the fruit. And the woman says, the snake presented me with the fruit. And there it is us against them, me against you. Um, what's another story we could write? Of course, we're rewriting that story right now, aren't we? I mean, th this is how deeply into the human psyche of the human condition male supremacy goes. And so the Genesis story is a, a, a myth affirming male supremacy. This is the story of original sin. That's a phrase, by the way, that appears nowhere in Genesis. It's actually a, a distortion of what the Genesis story tells us, as if the first fact of the human condition was the binary opposition. Therefore, we have no choice but to look out for ourselves against the others. But the first affirmation Genesis makes is when God looks over the creation God has completed and says, God looked 
Uh, on the seventh day, God looked at all that God had done and said, this is good. This is very good. The human condition begins with the clear affirmation of the goodness of human experience. There is no winning and losing. We are not engaged in a, um, in a zero-sum game, which is the way we live. Original sin, no. Original blessedness. And to re return to my earlier point, this is an, a description of, of the world we are called to create. So feminism, the feminist movement, the movement for equality between males and females, the, the de-absolutizing of gender identity, which is also the physical claim of us against them. This movement that we're seeing unfold right in our own time is an example of the creation of a new story. And the Irish story, beginning with John Hume, Jerry Adams, Ian Paisley even, uh, is an, another instance of that. The Gorbachev, Reagan story is an instance of that. It happens. It can happen. If it happened, it can happen again. Yes. Doesn't it always have to happen in the sense that I'm listening to the philosophers among you, and I think of Hegel. And, and what we are talking about is an inevitable dialectic that produces infinite conflict. The question is why the end game, and this is the question, is hopeful rather than does it instead of creating despair. Now, Hegel would say the march of history is always going to be forward. I mean, what does that mean? We can, we can go quote Dr. King, you know, with the moral arc. Where does the optimism come from when we look around the world today, when we deal with issues like climate? Is, there, is the end game truly optimistic? Is there something in the church that says that? I don't know about, I haven't studied my religion, the other one, the, the, the Jewish religion, to know that it is necessarily a positive end game, but it does mean that the conflict is embedded if there is to be change. Yes, well, well you know, there's, uh, optimism isn't, uh, isn't the value I'm lifting up or living by. Optimism is uh, looking at the evidence and concluding things are getting better. Any look at the evidence uh, is hard to bring us to that conclusion. But optimism isn't the same thing as hope. John lifted up the idea of hope. And the difference is that hope involves a choice. Hope involves a choice. It's a choice of how we read the evidence. Even evidence of a drastic danger, drastic failure, drastic catastrophe, the end of the war in Afghanistan. Is there any recent instance of more moral and political and social failure than those weeks in August last year? And how they made us feel, and the trap it was uh, and we were clearly dealing with what had to be a kind of inevitable outcome of horrible choices made by our government. We still haven't reckoned with it, in fact. But we're not finished. We're not finished. I mean, one of the reasons we know how terrible the actions of Afghan of the American government in Afghanistan was, was the way in which it made us remember it with such power the failures we had made in Vietnam and the jolt it was when we had to face the fact that we had done it again and that we had done it again. Does that mean we're condemned to always do it? I don't think so. I think that human beings are the creatures who learn from history. That's debatable, I understand that. But I'm insisting that there's in the experience we have as people in this condition, 
we mustn't ever forget that we bring to the condition the capacity for choosing. And that's the hope. As long as there is the capacity for choosing. You remember um, Primo Levi. I can't change the condition I'm suffering, but I can control my attitude toward it. I can choose how to think about it. Other comments or questions? We'll take one, one more. Sure. Hey there, Jim. Um, there are two Genesis stories, of course. Um, and the first one, uh, Adam and Eve aren't there. Male and female, he created them as pairs. So there is, that binary isn't there. But what is, and when you speak of our choice of the, of the myths, of what we're going to find as ground zero of your omega point, there's still that binary against nature. There's still that anthropocentrism, even in the first Genesis story. Mm -hmm. And could you speak about that? And, and our choice of using that Genesis story as our omega point altogether, when cultures around the world have suffered for it. Yeah. That's a very important point. It invites me to elaborate on what I was saying about Genesis. Genesis is a text that should be preached against itself, not just in the male-female question. And you're right, the beginning, the, the original blessedness, as opposed to the original sin, the original blessedness did include male and female. God created human beings in God's own image and likeness, male and female, he created them. I mean, that's the ultimate affirmation of the blessedness, the goodness of male and female. So, of course, you're right. It was the choice that led to, she told me to do it. But uh, us against them, the human species against nature, claiming imperial power over the creatures that we claim the authority to name. That whole narrative uh, in Genesis has uh, poisoned something in the human imagination. It's essential to the exploitation of the earth as we're living through it now. Absolutely right. I couldn't agree more, Barbara. That text, like so many others in the biblical tradition, but not just the biblical tradition, the United States Constitution our sacred texts generally need to be criticized, and they, needed, and they, they need to be argued against. And the, uh, my own view is we need to take the meaning of those texts and turn them back upon themselves. So the defense of slavery that's implicit in the U.S. Constitution needs to be contradicted and rejected based on the foundational principles of the Constitution. That's our, that's our hope, I think. Same with the biblical tradition. All of the racism, all of the sexism, all of, in our Christian texts, the anti-Semitism. We, we Christians just entered the season of Lent all over the world, Christian preachers are going to be rehashing the story of Jesus. I began by remembering my great uncle Jim and how in the Irish green nostalgia, we forgot that he was a soldier in a British regiment. My mother told me that, you know, in the 50s and 60s. So. 40 or 50 or 60 years after the fact. It was in those years that the family story flipped for human reasons, because human beings are always doing this. And another in instance of the exact same phenomenon with even deadlier consequences was in the 40, 50, and 60 years after the death of Jesus, his followers began to tell that story as if he wasn't a Jew. Jesus' 
was an enemy of his own people in the Christian memory, which is embedded in the Gospels, which were written beginning in the year 70, so 40 years after the death of Jesus. So in those 40 years, for reasons that we condescend to and, and condemn at our peril, because we do it too, in those 40 years, something essential to the truth was forgotten and then contradicted with lethal consequences. And the consequences of the Irish nostalgia were lethal through the 20th century. The consequences of Christian nostalgia have been lethal for 2,000 years, not just for Jews, but for the earth itself. So this is the criticism, the work that we have to constantly do. And how do we do it? We do it by the stories we tell. I'll end with that thought, that point, a beginning, a middle, and an end, the organization of, ex of chaotic experience according to the law of meaning, always subjecting it to criticism, always subjecting it, always subjecting it to revision and to reinterpretation because it's never finished. And that's how human beings surpass themselves. We are the creatures defined by our capacity to surpass ourselves. Kevin, I can't thank you enough for the honor of being here. Thank you so much.